If you're empty and you can't find meaning in other people, in being service to other people, or contributing to society, I, I don't know what we're, I know what we're doing here. Well, welcome. I am very excited to have with me today Dr. Drew, and we'll be talking with him in just one second. But first, look, everybody looks better in a suit. Dr. Drew is the best dressed man on the planet, but even Dr. Drew would look great in Indochino because Indochino is the world's largest made-to-measure menswear company. They've been featured in major publications, including GQ, Forbes, and Fast Company. Company. They make suits and shirts made to your exact measurements for a great fit. Dudes love the wide selection of high-quality fabrics, the option to personalize all the details, including your lapel, your lining, your monogram. So here's how it works. You can go to a showroom. They have one in Beverly Hills or they have them all around the country, or you can shop online at Indochino.com. You can pick your fabric, choose your customizations, submit your measurements. I've done it myself. It is super cool. And then you wait for your custom suit to arrive in just a few weeks, and it fits you like a glove. This week, my listeners can get any, any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when you enter Shapiro at checkout. Again, use that promo code Shapiro. You get 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit, and shipping is free. So Indochino.com, promo code Shapiro, any premium suit, 379 bucks and free shipping. You look like James Bond, but you don't have to pay James Bond prices. It's an incredible deal for a suit that will fit you better than anything off the rack could. Indochino.com, use that promo code Shapiro. Okay, so now, Dr. Drew, thank you for stopping by. Dr. Drew, for those who don't know, and you've been hiding under a rock for the last 20, 30 years, uh, Dr. Drew <laughs> is the original host of Loveline, which is where I first got to know his work, just like everybody else. But he is currently a host over at KBC in Los Angeles on middays. Uh, he also does five separate podcasts. Uh, I've got Adam and Drew. got mm -hmm. Drew. We got the, the Swole Patrol, which is a health and fitness podcast. And another one with Bob Forrest, the guy with the hat and the glasses that I did celebrity rehab with, uh, called This Life. It's about it's mental health and addiction, that kind of stuff. So Dr. Drew has a very, very full plate. Busy. And, busy. Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad that you had time to come over here I, and talk I, with us. I, I was thinking about as you were talking about the suits I'm going to buy, by the way. It sounds like too good, to, too good a deal to let go. But but I, I want you to change my mind today. I like, and, uh, Unfortunately, we live in a world where people don't like to change their mind. I cannot understand that. I, my mind changing is how I grow. That, that's what I, I want you to change my mind. So... Well, this is this is why I think this is why I think uh, so many you're so popular. One of the one of the reasons that a lot of the people we have on, I think, are so popular is because if you view life as a journey through knowledge, I think that you have a much better time doing it, and also you're less likely to become ticked off. Uh, so one of the things that's great about what you do is that you talk with a lot of people from a lot of variant points of view, but you're pretty even keel. I mean, it's, yeah, you're not in the business of getting angry. I, 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 the hubris is the furthest thing from what I think I should be, and when people become hubristic, I, I get kind of, that's where I get pissed. Because the human experience is so complex and so rich, for anybody to stand off and tell you this is how it's got to be, I, I, I get a little pissed off. About that. So before we get into any of the deep stuff, I first want to get something off the table because okay. obviously there's an elephant in the room for those who know yeah. um, our history together. So the first time that we ever met in person is when I was on your show back on CNN Headline News, yes. and it became sort of a cause celeb because there was an incident with Zoe Tur. Zoe Tur is a transgender woman, uh, a man who is, uh, in my opinion, believes he is a woman, uh, and uh, and Doctor and Doctor Drew was hosting the show. And in the middle, there was a bit of a conflagration when he started calling me names, suggesting I was a little boy. And I said, what are your genetics, sir? Not you, Zoe. Uh, and, uh, and at that I, point- I remember that part. I remember you calling her sir, and that's what got her- So it started there. off with me talking about genetics, and then, okay. and then Zoe saying, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy. I see. Uh, yeah. And then me responding, well, what are your genetics, sir? Okay. Uh, and that led, obviously, to this big kind of blow up and, and a national story and all the rest, and the rest is history. And, and I- I didn't produce it, and I apologize to you and to Zoe for putting you in that position. I had no idea that was the direction it was going to go. But I, I do remember, you know, I've done a lot of, <laughs> I've run a lot of groups in my time. <laughs> and I know when groups are getting out of control and yeah. when there's potential for violence, I know how to jump in. I know where to jump in. And, and I also know where to let things kind of play out. And I felt, always felt like, okay, well, that's kind of, I'm not quite out of my chair yet on this one. Yeah. I, if I if you felt like I should have been, I apologize. Oh no no, no. Well, it wasn't it wasn't on you, and yeah. I didn't blame you for any of that. It was just yeah. a very weird and odd circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get that one off the table. Right. Doctors right. and I it are doesn't not bother angry at each other. No. Yeah. No, exactly. Is good. Everything is cool. So yeah. uh, okay. So now I want to talk a little bit. Let's just jump into uh, first some health issues, and then I want to get into sort of your personal philosophy. Okay. So uh, as a medical doctor yeah. uh, and somebody who, as you were telling me before the show, now gets to spend your days talking about things rather than working 5A to 10P, mm. uh, I, I want to ask you about a couple of things that seem to be plaguing the country. So the yeah. opioid epidemic is obviously a yeah. major issue yeah. on a, a, lot, a lot of people's minds, and there are a lot of debates over the cause of yeah. this upswing in opioid use. How much do you think that the opioid epidemic is a result of overprescription from doctors, and how much of it is a result of 
you know, the the influx of heroin into the cities okay. or so, moral so collapse. Or have you read the factors. book Dreamland? Yes. Okay. That that is how it happened. Yeah, I Sam lived Kinoza's it. Book. Sam Kinoza's book. I I talked to Sam, and I, when I call him, all I said is, "How did you how did you get it so right?" Because I lived through that, and I, he, that book describes it accurately. It is mostly perpetrated by my profession. If you look at the history of opiates, we've had two major opioid crises in this country. One was about 1880 after the Civil War. It's when we had the hypodermic needle. We created the hypodermic, we invented the hypodermic needle and invented morphine sulfate. These are wonderful drugs. For the first time, we could affect human suffering. We got carried away. We created a bunch of addicts. We didn't know what to do. We treated it with methamphetamine and cocaine <laughs> and all kinds of other crazy things. Uh, it, we've always made the same mistake, which is we become overenthusiastic, we don't understand what addiction is, we create addiction, and then we try to treat it with other drugs. We've mm -hmm. made that mistake many, many times. We're doing it again now. This time was extraordinary. There are a multiplicity of forces that came together to create it. There was, you know, the, the insurance situation, insurance companies sort of took over the practice of medicine. Everything had to be very quick, and there's no quicker way to end, up, end an appointment than opening a prescription pad. That and the fact that a group of uh, physicians decided that they would stake their reputation on the fact that opioids are not addictive and you could treat pain liberally. Pain became the fifth vital sign. The attorneys got involved with that and started not just suing doctors for malpractice, but criminally suing them, civilly suing them for inadequate treatment of pain. The state medical boards got involved, the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation. All these forces came together and said, pain is as important as your pulse. And pain controls what the patient says it is. Pain experiences what the patient says it is. We have these great medicines. Use them and you are a coward. You're actually a dangerous person if you don't. And so I was living through all that, trying to get everybody off them. My peers were putting them on them. And uh, I, I just will tell you, it was a catastrophe. And you would know 90% of the opiates on earth end up being prescribed in this country. And now we're beginning to find our way out of it. What happened was the heroin problem, as it, as it was documented in Dreamland, there was a group of people who learned how to distribute it very effectively at a time when my peers were cutting off patients. They were beginning to learn that, oh my God, we were creating drug addicts. So as opposed to bringing the patient into the office and going, look, we didn't intend this. I didn't mean to make an addict. We have now have a second problem. We're going to have to get this treated. What my peers did was said, you're a bad patient. You're, you're diverting your drugs. You're overusing your medicine. You're out of my practice. Well, when you kick an opiate addict out, they're going somewhere. And they're going somewhere cheaper and better, and that was heroin. And that's so, where we got the heroin. What do you think the solution to all this is? Because there's a lot of talk about you know putting a lot of government funding behind things, and it, yeah. it doesn't look like there's a, a very clean solution, and the government's always throwing money at there's things. There's not. And, and I want to say, too, that, that the, the, the soil in which this thing take, took place was about us, right? I mean, there, there's a, I, I don't know how else to describe it except to say, and this is a deeper conversation, that we are in the midst of a, a deep spiritual vacuum in this country, if not a crisis, and, and, and a world where life has no meaning and the interpersonal experience is void and painful, you're going for opiates. You're going for something. Yeah. You're going for You're going for something to try to relieve it. That's a different problem. Um, your other problem in terms of solution, your question in terms of solution is very controversial. I spoke to the head of the addiction program at Harvard just yesterday for a podcast coming out soon, um, and he and I both believe that they're, they got to get behind mutual aid societies, which are available in every corner and are free. And he's publishing a Cochrane study that's going to show that the outcome, that these, these treatments, mutual aid societies like 12-step and smart recovery, these sorts of things, are as effective or more so than any other treatment in terms of sustaining abstinence, if abstinence is a realistic goal. Of course, professional services are necessary and be required, but here's a free service mm -hmm. that has a good, that has scientific basis, it has evidence basis in science, and it's a good treatment we got to get behind that. There are replacement therapies out there like Suboxone and Methadone that people are scaling up. And, and, I, and I'm for that. It's just the excessive enthusiasm is deeply concerning to me. If you've if you got opiate addiction or I got opiate addiction, we'd be trying to work on an abstinence-based program because you wouldn't be able to do what you do without being off everything. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're taking half measures with a lot of patients, and, and that may be required. There may, not be a, there may not be a realistic possibility of surviving this disease and attaining abstinence. So I, it's I, complex. I, yeah, so it's I'd complex. like to go back, actually, to the, the first thing that you said, because I think that there, there the is a deeper vacuum. and more interesting oh conversation there. Yes, there is. Uh, you know, obviously, the rest uh, of it's medical. It's not yeah, so interesting. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting, but, but it's you know, treatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but, this thing, this thing I, I, I really, m m for me, spirituality exists between humans. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm a, sort of a Martin Buber style, okay. style idea. Of <laughs> I and thou. Oh, yeah. I and thou. And, and, and although his thinking is kind of 
I, I think more neurobiologically about it than, than I do the way Buber thinks philosophically about it. But I do think that there's something magical about the human relationship, the human experience. And I think there's a lot more that goes on between and amongst people than we yet even know. And we, that landscape of connectedness and intimacy and parenting and family has been forsaken for about 60 years, if, if not forsaken, demeaned. And the result has been a, a group of adults that are empty. Uh, and if you're empty and you can't find meaning in other people, in relationships, in being serviced to other people, and contributing to society, I, I don't know what we're I know what we're doing here. So why do you think I, that happened? Why Why do you think that well, 60 years ago there was this breakdown in sort of interpersonal relations? I have my own theories, but I'd like to hear yours. The, the, I, I, I will. I, at some point, I'm in this conversation. I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to tell you about my theory, but well, not theory, but the, the theories about how interpersonal connectedness yes. works neurobiologically. But why it happened? Um, it, it, my suspicion, mm, it depends what you mean by why, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? If, if it's why, my suspicion is it was some sort of reaction to the, the, the world wars of the first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. that those were so traumatic and the children of those wars, somehow that trauma was rained down upon them. At the same time, we decided families are not important, or relationships aren't important, or families don't matter, or it takes a village, or <laughs> what, whatever it is. I mean, families are the cornerstone of everything, and yeah. have always been throughout human history in every culture on throughout time. And whenever that has fallen apart, it has been to the detriment of the of society. I, I can only think of, you know, only extraordinarily uh, totalitarian systems like Sparta pulled that off, and they didn't pull it off for long. Otherwise, it is about the family, and we developed some sort of spiritual, some sort of philosophical, political idea. I, I can't really think of where it started or why it happened, but it certainly was there in the 60s and 70s. Yes, yeah, so I'll tell you my theory. So my theory yeah. is that there, I agree with you that in the aftermath of both world wars, yeah. there was an existential angst that sort of washed across the land. Yeah. But I think that a lot of that existential angst had to do not only with decline of religion, which you can see statistically taking a nosedive after World War II, but also having to do with this unfulfilled longing for community that had once been filled by either religion or a bunch of bad ideologies. So the feeling of communal purpose was lost. And without that communal purpose, we saw ourselves as atomistic individuals. When you read existentialist philosophy, yeah. it's always me versus the world, right? You yes. read Sartre and everything is about, here I am in this chaotic universe as this atomized human being, yes. and it's my will that's going to shape, it's gonna shape the world around me. Right. Well, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for a connection with other human beings. It does leave a whole lot of room for, for you to be by yourself. Right, and yet though, something unique happened in this country because go to Italy, or maybe not Italy is a good example, but there, there are plenty of other, certainly Western and even Eastern European countries where there was marked decline of religion, but the families remained. Mm -hmm. Families remained. And, and they did not have the same kind of BS that we've had. They've not had it. I mean, when you go, we, we have then started filling ourselves with so many things like money and cars and extreme activities that, that don't fill. It's a never-ending pit that we do here in this country. While there, they still have their families. They still have their family units. The, the existentialism you're talking about, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how we go down this path because I hate Sartre. I, I hate <laughs> but I But I like Heidegger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I don't like him. Obviously, yeah, right, he was right, a scoundrel. Right. Right. But his philosophy is kind of interesting and, and maybe really Husserl is where I belong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh and the idea that there can be a phenomenological explanation of our how we put experience and being together, that's appealing. It's, it's interesting. So, right? let's, so let's dumb that down for people who don't yeah. know any of those authors. So what, okay. do you, what do you mean by that? Okay, Husserl wanted to make a study of experience and being. Heidegger took that to another level. He sort of extrapolated from Husserl and started talking about a being that makes an issue of its being, meaning the human being. And we're the only being on earth that really makes an issue of being and our existence. Right. It's not I think, therefore I am. It's I, I am, therefore I, just, I am. I am, yeah, I am. I, I am in yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. and I'm being in the world right. and in a temporal frame. And all these things come together. And he, he goes way into outer space with it. It's a wonderful intellectual exercise. But it's how we think about neurobiology now, in a, in a way. And what I want to say about that neurobiology is that, that we've moved away from a single skull system. You know, in the 90s, we talked about the decade of the brain. There is a single skull. We're going to understand how the brain works. Turns out the brain does not work without other brains. And it really is, everything's in an interpersonal context. Where, where does yourself emerge but out of a relationship with mom and dad? And it emerges out of this relationship. 
There's another phenomenon that is just poorly discussed, which is the, uh, what, what people like me call affect regulation, the ability to be okay in our own skin, to be able to regulate emotions so they're not too prolonged, too intense, too negative. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the normal inter interact, normal frame for that to develop is it starts with mom. It starts being attuned to and being an object of scrutiny and learning that brains have content and learning that when I have a feeling, the mom reflects that back to me on her face and may offer me some soothing affects alongside that. That, that frame of closeness, of intimacy is what that is, is really where all meaning sort of resides in terms of feeling good about life and feeling good about yourself and experiencing yourself. That, and then we can move away from that and regulate autonomously. Well, when we've been traumatized or when trauma is raining through inter intergenerationally, that closed frame becomes dangerous. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of unpleasant material gets rained through, if not oh, shattering material, if physical abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, whatever it might be. And so the frame of closeness in which we can find so much meaning and satisfaction becomes a dangerous place that we don't go to. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna have you expand on that a little bit in one second. First, I have to say thanks to our sponsors over at Helix Sleep. So there's nobody on the planet like you, thank God. I mean, could anyone stand two of you? But you need your own mattress, okay? You need a mattress that is built for you. Working with the world's leading sleep experts, Helix Sleep developed a mattress that is customized to your specific height, weight, and sleep preferences so you can have the best sleep of your life at an unbeatable price. Here's how it works. You go to helixsleep.com, you fill out their two-minute sleep quiz, they'll design your custom mattress. They can even customize each side for you and a partner. In 2018, Helix Sleep has taken customized sleep to the next level with the Helix Pillow. Their all-new pillows are fully adjustable, so you can achieve perfect comfort regardless of sleep position or body type. They have thousands of five-star reviews. We use them at the Shapiro household. We actually took a Helix Sleep mattress, and you get it in the mail, you unfold it, and it just inflates right in front of you. We took a more expensive mattress, moved it out of our room because our Helix Sleep mattress is so good. All you have to do is go to helixsleep.com slash benguest right now, and you'll get up to 125 bucks toward your mattress order. That's helixsleep.com slash benguest, because I have a guest, for up to $125 off your mattress order. Again, that's helixsleep.com slash benguest. You'll definitely enjoy the Helix Sleep mattress. It's really terrific. Okay. So it's why I, I know you just interviewed Jordan Peterson. Is why I love him so much, because he, he would not disagree with anything I've said so mm -hmm. far. But he takes all of this into a sort of a deeper frame, and he has a religious overlay to it, an anthropological overlay, and looks for the patterns of human behavior that are sort of reflective of what our neurobiology is. And um, what I was thinking about is uh, how... We, we've sort of, I don't know why I'm jumping all the way to this, but I'm going to go, is we, we, we've, we've, missed, we've missed, in terms of understanding the human experience, we've become too relativistic in the sense that we just look at the superficial blush and not really ask the question of why do humans do that? Why, why are they like that? Why, why do the Aztecs tear somebody's heart out and throw it down the stairs every morning? Oh, it's because the sun, they believe the sun would come. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> they, oh, okay, we can stop there then. As opposed to, Oh my God, this was a population that had something called a codex, which was a systematic way to create a warrior by abusing the crap out of children. I mean, mm -hmm. vicious abuse. And when you take a bunch of people that are severely abused and you put them together, they have a hard time not acting their aggression out on one another. But if you focus that aggression out there mm -hmm. in somebody that you sacrifice every day, then there's this sort of a catharsis that goes on within the mob now we're okay today. We did it to that one. And I, I was I mentioned you before before we started, before the cameras heated up, that I wanted to mention human sacrifice. And it, it to me it's an informative phenomenon about the human being that no one ever looks at, and it's in plain sight here at all times. And that is that if you look at every print of religion, you find human sacrifice, right? And it, it's always there. It's always around. And then, and then it sort of started in, in Judaism. It started percolating over to, well, we'll have an animal substitute for the human. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, but, I mean, if you look at what Abraham, if people talk about the Abrahamic religion. What was Abraham doing when God sent the angel to, down to uh, grab his hand? He was going to sacrifice his son. He went to kill his son. It was even part of the ancient sacrifices that people did. And, and then some, some hallucination or whatever came through to him, and it changed everything in that moment. No more human sacrifice until evidently we started getting into it again with our aggressions. And then we decided, well, there's this one guy. We'll kill this. This one guy died for us. And so now we don't have to do any more of that because we can focus on the one guy. We drink his blood, eat his flesh and stuff and do these cannibalistic things that help us feel better. Whatever it is, deep in that is this primitive primate stuff that we never really look at. So the real question becomes, okay, so how did we get from there to here? 
Right, because of the, the, here being, the, here being a civilization where we oppose human sacrifice, for example, because there are all we've, we've learned to focus it and channel it in ways that have gotten us through periods of history where it could have been a problem. Right, but the the, the real question is why in our particular civilization, for example. So, for example, I, I don't think that all civilizations have developed an aversion to human sacrifice quite to the same extent. Obviously, an, an aversion to it. Yes. I mean, what's it, the aversion? People, people have a guy on a cross, and they pray to it, and that's well, a I mean, sacrifice. Well, that's 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 a constant reminder of human sacrifice, right? But it's, it's, not, it's not people who are saying that it is good to go out and, and participate no, in human sacrifice. They're no, saying the they opposite, deal with right? it by focusing on this one guy that did and, we sacrifice. And, the, but, and this is this is sort of the point that I'm trying to make, which yeah. is that the the Judeo Christian tradition, yeah. in attempting to eradicate human sacrifice, yeah. right? The, the Bible is very harsh about human sacrifice. Yeah. It's one of the big things, and it's yeah. one of the big puzzles about Abraham. So the traditional Jewish read on that is that this was Abraham's struggle. Is He's being told to do something he knows is immoral because God has already told him it's immoral to do this. Thank and God so, he doesn't do it. That's all and, I know. Right. And then, and, then he, and then he doesn't go ahead and do yeah. it, presumably because, you know, he's not supposed to do it and God does it. So I have, I have my own sort of understanding of that, a kind of Kierkegaardian but, but, understanding but, but of, of how that cool works. I'm cool with theological interpretation, but the point is there's an anthropological thing going on here too. Oh, there's no, no, no the, question. And so, and it's deep and right. it's profound. And, and the, the only point that I'm making is we somehow got from people who sacrifice each other on the steps of yes. giant temples yes. to the place where we have such a, a, a innate now, almost innate, abhorrence yes. of, of this idea, yeah. but it didn't you, you know, take everywhere, right? Because, the, no. because the fact is that there, you know, 70 years ago, there was a human sacrifice of literally tens of millions of human beings, and we were fine with that. How, you're talking about genocide and how, you know, well, look, look at my theory. My theory would be that the reason that we're able to focus and not be that way is because of families, because, because our experience and development and our experience of self and other and the ability to develop, develop affect includes the experience of love. And ultimately, if we do enough connection with other people, we develop something called empathy. And with empathy, no way we're going to do stuff like that, right? So that's the that's the highest order human development is is deep empathy of other people to be able to really appreciate other people's contents of their minds. If you're being traumatized and beaten or in war or you're living in you know horrible circumstances, you're going to be prone to aggression. So how do, how do we balance these two needs? This need for family and this need for community and this yeah. need for interaction yeah. with the fact that we live in an individual rights society that suggests that you as an individual are the highest point. Of, yes. of our system. How do we build a system that balances these two, these two I, things? I think w we distinguish, you know, what's healthy and what's politically proper, right? It's healthy to be part of a community. It's healthy to sacrifice on behalf of the community. My rights and privileges should be as an individual. But I think we've even gone way too far with that. I mean, the fact that you walk outside the street and you find a homeless encampment, those people are not, we're allowing those people to right, suffer. Those people are not capable of, and there, there are a lot of mental, the percentage of mentally ill among the homeless is extraordinarily high. severely mentally yes. ill, and we're, we're allowing them, and, and I've been through the experience a number of times where you get them and treat them, and they look back and go, who the hell let me still like right. them? They're angry. So their civil liberties are being protected? I mean, that's way too far. And by the way, you're, there's going to be an infectious disease outbreak here in Los Angeles this summer off of these encampments. I promise you, it's not going to be pretty. And so we have sanitation failure, we have human suffering in the streets, we have inability to intervene on their behalf to do make them help them, and we're and we're and we're endangering the entire population of Los Angeles because of sanitation failure. What is that? Yeah, what have we done? It seems like the the society has bifurcated into radical individualism versus radical communitarianism, and the the in between has sort yeah. of disappeared. So yeah, no, the, the, the American, I don't think the radical communitarianism really knows what they even mean by that yet. Yeah, I mean, that's that feels, right. That even that feels sort of like a narcissistic acting out, like, well, it's radical communitarianism, but I'll be in charge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's, exa that's exactly right. I mean, yeah. the people who are, who are pushing radical communitarianism will completely deny any of the possibilities of those things going bad, because obviously, how could it possibly go bad? Uh, I'm going to be running it. It'll and, be great. And, and again, but, I, and, and right, I, it, I, it's different this time because I'm running it, number right. one. And the I'm that's running it has not read history, <laughs> Right. I guarantee you, because... I can't think of a time in history where it didn't go bad. Right. And that, that's one of the things that I find so fascinating about the American founding in particular, because the American ideology from root was that it was your job to, it was government's job to stay out of your way, but it was your job to be virtuous. This was the balance. Virtuous and, and educated, so you lived up to the responsibility of self-government. Right. This is, and, and George Washington talks about this, yeah. and all the founders talked about and, this. And it was, it was so great. It was so, gee, and it, we're forsaking it. Yeah. We don't even, st we don't, people aren't even aware of and, it. And both sides were, were forsaking it. On the one side, we yeah. say, you don't need virtue. All you need is just find your bliss, do what you want to do, 
other people are objects. That's that's fine. We deny that that's what we're doing, but in reality, there's a lot of that going on. I see. I'm sure you see it much more in in terms of broken interpersonal relationships. In terms of, I mean, it's, it's out of control. This is what I I get so many letters from people who listen to my show, and I don't talk about this stuff particularly often on yeah. my show, but because. I'm younger and because I talk about my relationship with my wife and, and all this, I get a lot of letters from people who say I have a really screwed up relationship with, with this other person. And typically that's happening because they're not even talking to one another. They're talking past one another. They're not seeing each other as independent human beings with a set of values. And then they're not basing their relationships off that shared value at all. Yes. Uh, and, and yes and yes. But a lot of what you're describing is shared intellectual experiences, which is, again, about listening to each other and appreciating each other's values and points of view, but there's a d deeper piece, but they're not even experiencing each other as wholly there, you know, you're, you're, as the other person's mind having real agency and content. It's just sort of somebody that I use to feel better. You know, so, so, I'll ask you, so I'll ask you a practical dating question that yeah, I've gotten a lot, because okay. so, this is fun. I mean, as long as I got uh, you here. You got so the, pr the practical dating question that I get a lot yeah. is, should people who have different value systems uh, or different religions, for example, date yeah. each other. So my typical answer on this yeah. is no. Is that you should? Is that if you want to have a long-lasting relationship with somebody, you're both going to get old and wrinkly, and you're both going to not be as handsome and pretty as you once were, and you're not going to be as sexually attracted to that person as you yeah. once were. But what you see from the studies is that levels of commitment, committed love, go up over time, yeah. and levels of infatuate love go radically down after the first six, seven months. That's true. Uh, and so, if you actually want to build a committed love, then that has to be built on a shared purpose, yep. which can only be found in a share, shared set of values. So mm, that sh shared purpose, I'll go with you all the way there. Okay. But but shared sets of values can be developed in the relationship and the family. Okay, that's establishing, fair. right? And, but if you have to bet. Are you going to bet on if the people you, who share I'm, values? I'm or? going to. I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to give defer to my host, which is that if you look at common scripts, things tend to go better. Mm -hmm. So life scripts, family scripts, yeah. family of origin scripts, things where everything's already sort of self-evident to one another, that tends to help relationships go along. But but I but having said that, of course, the exceptions are always the radical differences where people form these new phenomenological experiences together, and that's very rich and it's dangerous. You're, yeah. you're right. That's, that's it, it, the, the, it, there might be a risk reward ratio. Yeah, there. It's a risk reward ratio, but but I wouldn't discourage somebody from that just based on that for any more reason that I would discourage you and I from having a good dialogue. You know. I mean, yeah, but I don't think we should get married. Just breaking it not, to now. I'm yeah, so sorry. <laughs> I was attending. I was brought something with me. Damn it! You know, oh. there, there goes the rest of the show. The big, the big reveal at the end. I mean, I can't believe I blew it. So, so let's talk a little bit uh, about you know your experiences. In, I want to get back to the deep philosophy stuff because yeah. this is the fun stuff. Yes. But let's talk a little bit about your experiences in the media because yeah. uh, you're you politically are. I would say, kind of libertarian-ish. Yeah. Is that it, fair? Well, it's so funny. I, I always thought I was well, recently. I've been Republican, I've been Democrat, and then I thought, I'm independent. So I registered independent. What do you think happens when you register independent? You, it's you, an actual party here? Unless yeah. you're careful, you get assigned to the American Independent Party. So I think that's actually what I was going Because I was going to I was gonna go libertarian. I thought, no, that would change who I could vote for and stuff. And I'm not really a libertarian, but I kind of am. And and my daughter, who's pretty way left, said, I, well, the, you're a libertarian, you're just you're right wing that. I'm like, well, I, I'm not. And then I started talking on the radio about solving the homelessness problem. And I'm I'm concerned about the lack of government functioning, yeah. basic functioning. And people started going to me, Leo Terrell, you know Leo Terrell? Yeah, of course. Leo goes to me, he goes, who do you want to solve that problem? Go government? And I go, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. He goes, Government, Mr. Libertarian, you want the government to solve that problem? And I'm like, right. well, so I-, I of, the, of the libertarian philosophy, I mean, I consider myself fairly conservative slash libertarian. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that most libertarians, there, there's different branches. And you and I yeah. agree on this. Like, I, I, I've been I asked, like the Fed. I think the Fed, I, I mean, you may not like the Fed. Mm, but, yeah, but, 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 but I, I like freedom. Well, and I think we've lost the, the freedom and liberty. That's what this country was about. I mean, and we just lost the value in, in, in that as though that's a self-evident given for everybody. And, and I think people are looking to take away other people's freedom in the name of I'm not sure what. Self-realization, self-esteem. Flexing their own ideologies. And, and if you ever look at wherever ideologies prevail in human history, humans suffer. Wherever ideology is the prevailing wind that blows, it does not go well for people. And all I'm concerned about is that people should thrive. That's all I'm concerned about. And I, and I believe mostly that's what most people want, the vast majority, I would say. It's it just how we get there is what we disagree on. And that we can't talk about that is really distressing because I just want humans to do well. I want them to thrive. I want them all to thrive. And I deal with a lot that really have trouble thriving, drug addicts and narcissists. And stuff. It's very difficult for them. Yet, we get them. We get them. It's an interesting experience. So do we, here, here's a question for you. Yeah. Do we know enough about 
psychology to use psychology as a guide when it comes to policymaking. Because if you look back at sort of the history of the use of psychology, like there's, there's a whole wing of people right now yeah. who say, if we just thought scientifically about things, if we just brought all the data to bear, then yeah. policy would inevitably arise. And you look back at, at the self-esteem movement, the self-realization movement, which yeah. was based on a fair bit of bad science. Disaster. And, and it just manufactured an entire generation of people yeah. who were incapable of functioning outside the realm of, I have to be in my own little bubble. I'm going to let you answer the question. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsors over at Policy Genius. So the truth is a healthy 35-year-old can get half a million bucks in coverage for less than $30 a month. So what are you waiting for? I understand you think you're never going to die. You're wrong. You are. Okay. And when you do, then your corpse will not be cold on the floor yet before your family starts paying for you and it will make them poor. So what you actually need to do is go get some life insurance right now. And getting life insurance does not have to be complicated because of Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare life insurance online. In just five minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers to find the best policy for you. Policy Genius has helped over 4 million people shop for insurance, placed over $20 billion in coverage. They don't just make life insurance easy. They also compare disability insurance and renter's insurance and health insurance. If you care about it, they can cover it. So if you've been thinking about getting life insurance, go to policygenius.com. It's the easy way to compare the top insurers and find the best policy for you. Again, save time and money and hassle, and it's free over at Policy Genius. Again, comparing life insurance doesn't need to be a pain in the neck. Check it out, Policy Genius. All right. So I'm, I'm fascinated by social sciences, right? I, I really love reading about it. I love, I, love, I love the people that are in that space and trying to make sense of things. But technically, they're not really sciences, right? You, you can't do placebo-controlled studies. You can't do create a hypothesis and create an experiment on giant human populations and then have a null <laughs> hypothesis. And you, you can't do science in the, in the real sense of doing science. And it, in itself sort of infinitely complex, right? And so here it is something we can't do science. It's infinitely complex. We can be informed in our decision-making by psychology, and we can sort of see if we can help but guide good decision-making. But to have it be the sort of 1984-style, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the way politics is or... or, or, or History is in, is created. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. And and I had a personal experience of this just recently when, it, when you know I, when Trump was coming on the scene, I was trying I was trying to understand it. I didn't I couldn't get it. I was like, well, why? What's this guy for you? I, and people were there was a lot of enthusiasm. And then he's elected, and then people are asking me to evaluate his mental health and he's manic and he's this and this thing. She is, and 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 I started sort of looking at his personality and his you know mood stuff and. I thought, wow, um, is this good or bad? I, I, I don't know. It's too complex. And then I thought, oh, my goodness. Hmm. My very favorite president had all these same characteristics. Teddy Roosevelt was essentially <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> same guy. Same dude. I mean, you couldn't sit and have a conversation. I mean, you'd have to walk through Central Park mm -hmm. with him or Washington, D.C. or whatever because he was so manic he couldn't sit still. He had some later in life some real problems <laughs> because of that, that bipolar stuff. Um, but as president, it, it was spectacular. It was crazy. It was a lot of crazy making, but it ended up because of his judgment and because of who he is as a human being and because of his instincts and, and the way he adjusted to some of the decisions he made and, and the philosophy and the intent and the thinking going forward, Teddy Roosevelt ended up where it needed to go. And, and, and the same is true, like in, in not to, this is kind of a weird sidebar, but you know, in medicine, we, we make decisions. You make your decisions based on your instinct and you're, you're informed by your experience. You don't expect to be right necessarily. You have a backup plan and you watch and you adjust and you think and you, you're careful and you set the table around the decision you made so you make sure that things don't run amok. That's what presidents are supposed to do, I think. And that takes a lot of energy and it's a lot of um, leadership in a way that I, I've been thinking A willingness lately. to take risk and trial and error. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a kind of a leadership that we've not seen lately. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But certainly science isn't informed. So, I mean, in that vein, you know, one of the things that, that is becoming clear is that one of the reasons our politics is broken is because everyone is tempted to jump to psychologically uh, diagnosing one another. Yeah. So what you see in the, what you see so much in the public debate is you're saying X. The real reason you're saying X is because you really believe Y or because you're crazy or because you suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. Lots or and, and so the, the question is, how much do you, as a medical doctor, how much of that do you think is appropriate in the public sphere? Well, it's, it's inappropriate. It's okay for a physician or a psychologist to talk about in generalities in cases like that. But to say you're thinking X because of Y, for even for a well-trained person, no, not unless you spent years in the 
on the couch with that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for a non-trained person to do it is sort of uh, the, the lunacy. Yeah, and, and I, I, the reason I ask is because I think that a, a lot of this reliance on sort of junk science has become yeah. uh, very easy in the media. It's, it's a good way to dismiss your opponent. Uh, on the basis of, of sort can, of can faux you give science. Can example? I'm not sure I hear it so much. Uh, sure. So, what, so in this last election cycle, yeah. there was, a, there was a, a, constantly what you would hear from people is that the real reason that people were voting for Donald Trump oh. uh, is because they were crazy or because right. they had suffered when they were children or yeah, because yeah. they were poor. Uh, and there was a wide variety of people who voted for Donald Trump. Yes. I didn't vote for Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I doubt that you voted for Donald right. Trump. But the, but the attempt to kind of diagnose everybody who is opposite you as suffering from some sort yeah. of yeah. personality disorder right. actually has pretty deep roots going all the way back to the post-World War II kind of Eric Fromm school of diagnosis, where there's the authoritarian personality. And if you support Trump, it's because you have an authoritarian personality type. Do you think any of that sort of stuff is appropriate or is it just It's not appropriate, it's false. Uh, but, but it really, you know, it really has echoes of, you know, something much more sinister, mm-hmm. which, is, which is labeling people as your ex, your whatever, your other, your other, whether it's psychological or skin color or religion or philosophy, whatever it might be. The tribalism is just insanely... I, 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 it's so prevalent and it's so much a part of how our brains work. It, it, it had some evolutionary adaptive advantage to it, but it's running amok right now for some reason. I can't quite figure out why, how well, we got here. Well, so let's talk about the media a little bit, because yeah. in that realm, uh, you were basically tossed off of CNN headline news. Well, let me, let me tell you uh, a story. Yes. So, so I was not. It turns out I was not. And you <laughs> okay. can still believe I was, which is interesting. Um, I, uh, you and I had a little conflict once on Adam's show. When yes. Me and Adam and Drew show, and you were telling me that the news was so biased. And I was like, man, I, no one's ever told me what to say or not to say or anything, which was true. Right. At HLN, we were sort of doing true crime and sort of C and B D stories in the news, and no one ever ever came to me about the way I should present my opinion or the or the news. Seems like a different era. <laughs> Seems like a different time. Um, and and I and you assured me that I was naive, and I started thinking about it. I thought, well, yeah, I guess those guys kind of have their own point of view, and I guess it kind of does come across, but it's not affecting me, and I don't feel like it's a system wide sort of institutionalized sort of mandate of any type. It just didn't. I, these were just these personalities as the guys they hired, and I guess that's what they like. Well, then they decided to stop my show. Okay. Then I was on the radio. No, no. Then I was on. I was on. Uh, um, on Don Lemon. Yeah, Don Le- I was on Don Lemon's show, and he said, "Let's do analysis of Donald Trump's personality." And I went, "All right." And I started. And I had thought of this Teddy Roosevelt thing at the time. I said, "You know, business people can be very hypomanic. He's got all those hypomanic qualities, but and there's no doubt some narcissism, like all politicians." And and but it, I don't see malignant narcissism because his relationship with his kids is too good, and the kids would not be t- putting up with that if it was really a malignant narcissism. And then I went on Teddy Roosevelt, who really was a malignant narcissist, <laughs> and I said, you know, you don't know just because somebody's one thing doesn't mean they're make a bad leader or a bad president. And I was sort of making that point. I talked for probably 10 minutes on, on their air. The next morning, my radio uh, at KBC, my radio guy who you know, Drew Hayes, just goes, hey, that was pretty good. Do, do 30 seconds for us on our website. And I went, okay. So I did it in 30 seconds. And as I was getting up, and he goes, you know, you should really balance that out. Do you have 30 seconds on Hillary? And I go, yeah, they just released her medical records today, and it really bothered me what the doctors were doing. So I, I did 30 seconds on not her health, on the seriousness of her health and the, and the kinds of decisions the doctors are making, which was, were bizarre. It was, it, whenever I see weird decision making by a physician, I was, and, and it's a celebrity, I know, that, I know it's the doctors you know, being addled by taking care of celebrities and sort of letting mm-hmm. the celebrity dictate. I mean, I, I just look at Michael Jackson, look at Prince. I mean, just, it's just everywhere. It happens all the time. And so I was just being critical of the, the care she was getting. Well, Drudge picked that up, and they they portrayed it as finally a doctor's uh, brave enough to say Hillary's sick, <laughs> which is not what I said. It's not what I said. But then CNN picked it up, and they came down on me like a ton of bricks. I, I mean, it was intense. So it's fine when you're diagnosing Trump, right. but the moment the, the, that you said anything about Hillary yeah. Clinton, and I thought, yeah. wow, that that's pretty telling. I, I was I was shocked and surprised by that, a- and. Um, was already a decision already made to stop the show. So it was not like we're going to fire. It was just like, like, listen, this is a very difficult time. And it was upset people were like calling me. And, and I was like, I, 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 didn't, it's not, I don't want to be in the middle of this. So I, I'm out. So I just didn't say a thing. Now, they announced two weeks later that I'd stop the show. Well, the world, social media went, aha, see? So, so they went from 
crucifying me because I'd say anything ter- anything at all negative about Hillary. So her world was was mobilized, and then I became the sacrificial. I became the scapegoat for everybody by having lost my job, and everyone <laughs> sort of felt good, sided with me, even though none of it had actually happened. <laughs> none of it was true. And um, and I told I called HLN the the brass. I said, let me let me straighten this out. I, I don't have any hard feelings. This isn't what happened. Let me straighten it out. Just shut up. Mm, interesting. So, well, I, I think that one of the things that that you know to bring some of this full circle, uh, one of the things that is, has clearly happened is that the level of polarization in politics is leading to an enormous amount of anger, and that's leading to an enormous amount of reactivity. And I think that- It's so oh, un- uncomfortable. It's so unpleasant. It is. It's unnecessary, too. I mean, the, the level of, of just, I mean, if, I don't know, you, you have a huge following on Twitter, but you don't spend an awful lot of time on Twitter, it doesn't I, I, look it's like. It's so dangerous. It's so scary for me to say anything, because it just, you just get, <laughs> you just it, get that, That's exactly right. It feels yeah. like the, the, there's just a swarm that just well, eats you immediately. And, and I, you know, I wrote that book on narcissism, uh, the, the Mirror Effect. And I wanted to put an entire chapter, I actually wrote most of it, about other periods of history where narcissism had emerged so prominently. And, and every time, I was looking at pre-revolutionary France, and I was mm-hmm. looking at times like that, and when you see a lot of narcissism, a lot of childhood trauma, then a lot of narcissism, and again, that's because of our destroyed family, we have lots of traumatized kids, uh, you see mob, mobs develop. So are you concerned that that's what's going to happen next? It is. With social media, is mob behavior. It's it's happening. Now they don't have to go. Do you think that street. breaks out anywhere further, or is that, that restrict itself to social media? We've had a few little outbursts. We've, you know, I don't think you're going to. No, I don't think it's going to be big mobs. And I think I think I feel like we're on the backside of some of it a little bit. And, and some it doesn't feel like it's calming down. Well, I, I think that what, one of the things that's happened is that the the mob mentality has become so obviously tribal that people are now rebelling against the tribalism. It's become so extreme yeah. that there's there's this push against it. So yeah. I, I see that mostly in the reaction to identity politics. So I see that there are a lot of people right now where if you state a fact, people will immediately accuse you of being a sexist, racist, bigot, homophobe. Right, if you right. say, for example, that the statistics that are usually cited about the wage gap are just plain wrong, yeah. or if you suggest that there are biological differences between men and women, because there are biological differences between men and women, obviously, yes. every doctor ever has to diagnose Ooh. somebody. I mean, that's, that's, Why do we have gynecologists if there's no difference? It's so absurd. I mean, I was hearing from a doctor friend of mine that there was a, a transgender person who came in and the hospital had been instructed that instead of that person writing down their biological sex on their form, they should instead write down their gender. They should write their perceived biological sex, their perceived gender. And so the person came in and if they had not done, they were complaining of lower stomach pain. Well, I mean, you're going to get a wildly different diagnosis based on whether that is a man or a woman Absolutely. if it's lower stomach pain. Absolutely. And yet, if you say so much as that, there are a bunch of people who are willing to come down on you and just yeah, destroy I, you for I that. I don't understand why we can't say that there are populations that have been ill-served because of science or because of lack of sensitivity to certain things. And now let's talk about the science. And, and let's hope that, and let's state up front that we don't want that science to be used to marginalize or condemn or uh, be used improperly to hurt other people. But let's just discuss the science. How, how else do we, tr- do we create equality unless we understand the differences? The, the, it's, it's, I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln said it. He said, he goes, he goes, we're not equal in all respects. He said it in the Lincoln Douglas debates, but it's about creating a level playing field, an environment where everybody has equal opportunity, equal probability of success. No, maybe uh, probability is not the at right least a, At least a right to success. Everybody has an, has an equal, uh, there are no bars in the way, in other words. I, 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 would, I would say even if we can, you know, if we know the differences and some people need a little help or something, we can talk about helping it if there's a biological difference that we can discuss or a scientific phenomenon that is relevant to helping one group out versus another or keeping another group, I, I, whatever it is, let's just discuss the science. Because if we can't discuss the science, we, we're not in reality anymore. And this is what I'm saying with people. This, this, this is why I say I think there's a unifying moment that's happening because people on the political left, you know, Sam Harris, who is a Hillary Clinton acolyte and is yeah. a voter, and, uh, and he, he was basically thrown out of good company by people like Ezra Klein because they had the temerity to say that the IQ studies that exist about group differences are valid. He was not saying that they're not environmentally caused. He was just saying that right. they're just the raw data show that right. there are differences in IQ and, between and, groups. And science has been used historically to keep down inf- unfairly that population that fell out in those studies. Has been. But that has nothing to do with what Sam was saying. <laughs> and, and if the science is too provocative or too dangerous to be discussed, I don't know what we do it, but we still need a mechanism to discuss it. Because well, I the think science that, cannot, we, we're, what country am I living in 
where science can't just be discussed with, without it resulting in ad hominem attack. It's almost like there was a chain of thought that happened where people said, okay, science is going to make policy. And immediately, sci whatever science comes out, that will be the new guide for policy. No. And then all this new science came out and people said, well, we don't like the policy that we think would come out of that science, so we'll just get rid of the science. We won't, we won't do the science anyway. When the reality is, as you were saying earlier, there should be a gap between science and policy, and that gap is called ethics and morality and values, and that has to fill that in. It, 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 um, that's a pretty deep well, <laughs> that, <laughs> that well to figure out uh, of, of what we do in, in between uh, science and, and policy. And uh, that's another area that we as Americans don't spend a lot of attention and time thinking about, which is, I mean, I think virtue ethics people do think a bit about these days, but guiding philosophies and what's good for humanity, I, I don't think people spend So let's talk about that in just a second. Right. But first, I'm going to tell you to brush your teeth. Because, I mean, come on, people, brush <laughs> your teeth. The, the truth is, everybody is brushing your teeth wrong. Usually, you're not brushing it for long enough. You forget to change your brush on time. This... It, Tooth health has actually been linked to gum disease and heart disease. Most brands focus on, fla on selling flashy gimmicks rather than better brushing, not Quip. So what makes Quip better? Well, for starters, Quip is an electric toothbrush that is a fraction of the cost of bulkier they brushes. Have a timer. They have exactly. A timer that's on exactly there. right. And Dr. They send Drew knows. you the replacement on the brush. He is telling you the <laughs> truth, people. Okay. The reality is that Quip's built-in timer helps you clean for the dentist recommended two minutes with guiding pulses to ensure that you are reminded when to switch sides. Next. Quip subscription plans are for your health, not just convenience. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist recommended schedule every three months for just five bucks, including free shipping worldwide. And Quip comes with the mount that sections right to your mirror and unsticks. You can use it as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth. And finally, everybody loves Quip. Everybody likes them. Oprah likes them. Time likes them. Dr. Drew likes them. Like Come on. Them. The American Dental Association likes them. Plus, they're backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers use Quip every day. So, Quip starts at just 25 bucks. If you go to getquip.com slash benguest right now, you'll get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. Get your first refill, pa refill pack free again at getquip.com slash benguest. That's spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash benguest and get that first refill pack for free. Okay, so now we get into the very, very deep stuff, the, yeah. the marrow. So how, what, what sort of guiding philosophy do you think people ought to use for life? I feel like I need to either pace or lean back. <laughs> I can get on the couch for this. I have found um, a great starting point, and for some people, I, the, the, the finishing place too, is, is uh, Aristotle. I think he, he kind of figured things out. And I, and I like the way he approached science. He was an empiricist. I think that, uh, speaking of empiricism, I, I think that the pragmatists have a role, too. I think I'm a very prag I think pragmatism needs to come back again, where where the pragmatic outcome of what's good for humanity and human beings needs to take take a seat at the table. I can see why you and Jordan Peterson get along. Yeah, He's a pragmatist uh, as well. But 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 I do believe that a, a great way to think about a lot of things uh, was figured out by Aristotle. Uh, he he, I mean. You know, the, the whole concept of eudaimonia, right, it, it, which is we, we now think in terms of eudaimonic happiness versus hedonic happiness, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. the, the happiness literature is all very wacky because I'm not even sure in this country we know what we mean by happiness. Because we think, my, my, I kept telling, first, I first, when I first started seeing happiness literature, I was like, Jesus, my, my heroin acts are happy 8 a.m. when they get that <laughs> hit. That's happy, man. That's not what you're talking about. It's, it's leading a certain kind of life, really. And leading a certain kind of life may not always be comfortable and it may not always be hedonic. You have a positive hedonic tone, but it certainly should always be eudaimonic in the sense that there's something more nourishing, there's something more fulfilling. And one of the interesting things about, about Aristotle's sense of eudaimonia, which was he, you know, he had teleology and everything. Yep. Why do humans exist? They, hum they exist for eudaimonia. I think we mistranslated it as happiness for many years. I think it's actually sort of a thriving or nourishing or doing living well or something. Um, but virtue to, in accordance with right reason. Well, he did say that. Yeah, uh, he, he he that sort of was a sidebar on this. Where I want to go with mm -hmm. this is is a little bit different, which is that he he felt that in order to be armed properly to be able to achieve eudaimonia, you needed to have a certain amount of phronesis wisdom, a certain amount of techne skill. He had a he had a couple other criteria that didn't don't stay with me right now as much. But I but phronesis and skill I thought were very important. And, and and this is the part that people miss. They think that in, that that if I'm leading a certain kind of life, most people will come to the point that participating with other humans is what really gives something nourishing. Whether it's raising a family or being community or, you know, it, it being whatever it is. You know, it's not necessarily ladling soup at the homeless kitchen. It's good. It's also not being. Um, 
was Brad Brad uh, Pitt's wife's name? Uh, Angelina Jolie. Jolie is saving the world. That's not that does not feel that's not that fulfilling. It's good. I'm glad she does it, but it's not that fulfilling in the way that having a set of skills and wisdom to help another human being with something that they're struggling with. That's why I'm so grateful to be a physician. I, I have all that skill and wisdom of experience where I, I really am always loaded up and ready to do something like that. I'm very aware that that, that creates, if you use it and, and use it for good, use it to help others and, 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 and be, are aware that you're gifting somebody something with it, it's tremendously filling. It, it's always filling. You always feel a certain kind of eudaimonia. If, if I'm, I hope people understand that, that what I mean, balance, nourishment, being okay. And I had to have a few years of therapy in there too. I, I yeah. did, <laughs> but but I, I've always been, one of the things I'm most grateful for is I, I got this piece, I got this thing to offer. And I think we all got to remember and think about that. So the, so the question is, uh, and the reason I mentioned the, the teleology is, yeah. can you have eudaimonia in the absence of teleology? Can you have the eudaimonia without that piece where you say it's virtue in accordance with right reason and the whole system of Aristotle's, the idea of the unmoved mover, yes. the idea that you were created to do certain things and those things can be discoverable in the universe by virtue of what those things are. So you as a human being, you were created to reason because this is what distinguishes you from, from the creatures. animals. And if you are not actually acting in accordance with that right reason, uh, and and using that right reason in order to pursue these these naturally seen goals. Th there's a great book called The After Virtue by Alistair McLean, uh, McIntyre, rather. And his, his entire argument is that what's happened in the West is that Aristotle's version of virtue has fallen away yeah. and has been replaced by this other weird version of virtue, which is basically we define for ourselves what virtue is. So we got rid of the Greek teleology and we replaced it instead with this idea that you were just supposed to be a nice guy. And that's not actually what Aristotle is saying. What Aristotle is saying is that you have to act in accordance with your reason as applied to the highest seekings of human beings. So yeah. human desires often take a backseat. But uh, human desires do take a backseat, and we have been hedonic for at least 30 or 40 years. But we've also abdicated our personal responsibility to figure out our own virtue ethics to the government and the law. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with period. that. I mean, I, period. I, and I think that's why So we don't have a practice of that anymore. We just like the nanny takes care of us. Yeah. And I think that the 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 reason that I, I feel you know what what I'm what I'm often saying is that it's Athens and Jerusalem this is the Straussian model of what built Western civilization yep. is that yep. the the ethic of Judeo Christian values combined with this Greek teleology this search for reason which unite in philosophers like Aquinas where he's clearly trying to apply Aristotle to the Bible yep. that this is what has created Western civilization which is where I was trying to go earlier in the discussion about the movement from human sacrifice is that you have to combine a certain set of values and that people are actually not very good at discovering their own sets of values. That when people are trying to discover their sets of values, very often what they come up with is either damaging to themselves or damaging to others or a, or a way to try and control other people. And what, what I mean by that is that... Is yeah, there, you have evidence for that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that virtually the entire history of humanity between 1850 and 1950 is pretty good evidence of that. But that, that it's, when we try to arrive at our own virtues, we, we become maniacs, essentially. And not that we become maniacs, but that we tend to prioritize... Our feelings and our, our, our own needs. Our priorities over, yeah. over other people's priorities. It's, it's, it's hard to get to a place where you are prioritizing the larger concern of somebody else's humanity as an individual it's, human being over, even, your, over even over your utopian wishes. It, it, right? Ideology difficult. arises from your attempt to reach utopia. Yes. It's, it's difficult. To, to, our, we have a motivational system and it's difficult for us to escape it. And if it's charged up or if it's unregulated, watch out. And the, the reason that I say this is because well, when I went to Harvard Law School, our first day at Harvard Law, uh, I remember Elena Kagan was the dean. Uh, she's now in the Supreme Court. And she ushered us into this beautiful mahogany room, just gorgeous room, 500 kids there, all of us at the top, the cream of the crop, the yeah. people who had done the best on the LSATs, which means we're very smart. <laughs> and we're all there. And she turns to the entire audience and says, listen, you guys don't have to worry. The competition's over. This isn't the paper chase. Everything is good. You're all going to get jobs. And then she said the part, the part that really disturbed me is she said, and now you are going to be the masters of the universe. We have this number of justices on the Supreme Court. We have this number of people who are in the Senate. We have this number of people who are in the House of Representatives. You guys are the smartest, you're the best, you know the most, and you're gonna be the ones who are making all the rules. Oh boy. And I just thought to myself, well, this is how every bad thing in the history of humanity has yeah, happened right here. I mentioned hubris 45 minutes ago. That's hubristic. That, that's hubris. Whenever you think you know more than everybody, <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, you, there's a natural, there's a very natural sort of a, ebb from what she said to, well, I'll do whatever I want because I'm, I'm the, that guy. I'm the guy and on the top. Superman. And, but me, I'm yeah. going to tell you how to do it because I'm the best. Of that is a horrible, horrible feature of human beings. That, that is not how we should work. 
And so how do we restore the humility that's necessary? We've talked about all the humility, things we're missing gratitude. right now. Humility, uh, gratitude, baby. Humility, gratitude, break down a family structure, focus on atomistic individualism. Uh, how, how do we get back to, to basics here? What are, what are some practical things that you think we ought to be doing right now? Who's we? Uh, <laughs> anyone. It's... Anyone who's suffering from a feeling of, of purposelessness, uh, a feeling of anger over well, things that don't matter yeah. too much. Oh, man. I, you know, the literature shows it's very strange, but I, I've got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piece together a bunch of different little things. Uh, first thing you should do is make your bed. The happiness literature is very clear that if you start your day by making your bed, you're more likely to be happy. And it tends to set a tone for the day. Like as you start doing something, get off your ass, start doing something. Secondly, um, one thing you can do is to, I, I, I advocate this rather strongly, is to watch the relationships around you. And, and watch who you avoid and who you sort of gravitate towards. And start kind of hanging out with somebody you might not otherwise, it doesn't have to be somebody you, you, you're a, a, aversive to, but somebody different than you normally hang with. And, and tell them about yourself and find out about them. You will be stunned how often people have some moments of clarity about themselves as a result of something as simple as that. It, I, I call it seeing yourself with a new pair of glasses. Uh, self, you know, we have lots of delusions and denial and stuff about ourselves. And if we're not happy and we're in a bad sp spot, we're contributing to it somehow. And, and we can contribute to getting out of it. But if we don't really see ourselves as we are, it's very difficult to do that. And uh, I would attend to nutrition and exercise, all those simple things. And I would find some way to create meaning. How can I do something meaningful? Not how can I get happy or how can I, how can I make money? But What's meaningful for me? And it may mean listening to podcasts and reading for a while and, and figuring out, what, you know. What, Plato would have said that, right? He would have said, you sit around, you philosophize, this well, is what he, makes you happy. Well, luxury right? of that. Not everyone, <laughs> if, you're, if you're really in a sad spot, I mean, that's a, that's a tough thing to do, especially if you're, you're miserable, it's hard to concentrate and stuff. But, but, but you, can, you, can, you can build a life. And, I, and it's, it's really ultimately, it's about others. And it's about who you build your life with and spending time with people. And I'm not saying... It's not going out really in arousing circumstances. I think that's where colleges have really done young people a disservice. It's all about these extremely intense parties and drinking and all that, hooking up. Opposite, quiet, shared moments, thinking, talking, discussing things, being, being present with other people, but be fully present. Rigorous honesty, it's another thing that is, I've found to be extremely important. Practice it, practice it, you won't do it. This, you know, I, I think, um, David, uh, the virtue ethics, David Brooks mm -hmm. has some interesting things to say about developing character and virtue ethics. And, you know, listen to these podcasts and, and see where you can apply doing better. I, I don't understand why that's not thrilling for people. It, it, should, be, it should be extremely exciting. And, and then if you really get inspired, read about your country. I mean, th there's so much genius in this, this country we have. I, I, there's, I, I am so inspired by the founding fathers. And, and yes, they're all of their weaknesses and they're crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. They put together out of thin air, in the first time in history, a country based on ideas. Never happened before. And it has sustained us for 200 plus years. Get behind that notion and learn what it is and see if you can't contribute to it, at whatever that means for you, rather than... I, I'm not even sure our, our politicians even understand the country that they're serving right now, right. particularly on the state level. And, and and to un understand what it is and to where it was weak, make it stronger. But where it was a genius system, and again, it was based on philosophy. That's where they they looked at they looked at what had worked and what hasn't. And as another sidebar, I'm gravely concerned about California. I am gravely concerned about it. <laughs> and here's my biggest concern. Uh, for there's a million reasons to be concerned. We've already gone over some of them, but. Direct democracies never survive throughout human history. And we are very proud in this state of our referendum system, which is a direct democracy system. The rest of the country doesn't understand this. That is destined for failure. And it, I, think, I, if I, do, I think when the history books are written, they're going to look at that as the reason that California implodes and becomes three states. I think we might be three states sometimes. Wow. Soon. I, I really do. I, I'm, I, I would have been mortified by that thought about. We're going to have to move to Orange County because LA ain't going to be Yeah, well, we're gonna, <laughs> but you'll be able to at least determine your future a little bit. But, but I, I would have been mortified by that thought six months, for sure, twelve months ago. 
Now I'm starting to think there may be no other way out. Well, Dr. Drew, thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. That's You're not going to get a more eclectic conversation. Yes, I know. We're all over the place. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. It's wonderful. It's how I'm feeling today. It's it's really fun. I love picking it from every aspect of the tree, and it's wonderful to have you here. If you haven't listened to Dr. Drew's podcast, you definitely should. Go to drdrew.com is where everything is. Fantastic. So go check out drdrew.com. Dr. Drew, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. You too. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special was produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer Jeremy Boring. Associate producers Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And title credits by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.